Ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha, and I've been seeing a fair amount of arguments on social media and news articles these past several days surrounding the reveal trailer for Battlefield 5. The reactions to this trailer are extremely mixed for a couple of different reasons. The most visibly prominent right now are two main points. The first being the depiction of a British woman with a prosthetic limb fighting on the front lines in a World War II video game. The second being that the game trailer looks to be far more Call of Duty than it does Battlefield. Of course, given the current social and political climate, the vast majority of games media are focusing solely on the depictions of the women in the game trailer and cover art. Now, right now, as of recording this video, the release trailer's like-to-dislike ratio has tipped the balance and is sitting at 52% negative to 48% positive, with the number of views fast approaching 8 million. And as you can imagine, social media has been fairly aggressive as, especially on Twitter, people have vociferously defended DICE's decisions in this regard. Many of those defending DICE's decisions have pointed out how unrealistic video games can be, showcasing bugs and exploits that showed a person riding a horse with a flamethrower and a machine gunner on its back, or a jet pilot leaping out of their jet, shooting a person out of that jet, chasing them, and then grabbing onto and leaping into that jet as it went by. Others are also pointing out examples of celebrated women that did fight in World War II, citing French, Australian, and Russian examples, also the British Queen serving in the motor pool. And one of the more notable examples of women fighting during World War II were the Night Witches, which was the German nickname for the 46th Taman Guards Night Bomber Aviation Regiment, a Russian forces regiment that was comprised of female military aviators that flew night bombing missions in plywood biplanes. Now, these particular women were so hated by Nazi top brass that any German airman that downed one of the Night Witches was automatically awarded the German Iron Cross Medal. And you can thank my mother for being such a World War II buff that I actually happened to know a great deal of this right off the top of my head. However, I am in a position where I know enough about the topic at hand that I'm actually pretty confident that I could argue both sides of this supposed controversy successfully. I could easily defend the developers and their creative decisions based upon their own statements that Battlefield has never been a true-to-life depiction of history and that being able to play as a character type that you want isn't necessarily a bad thing, as long as you don't have to win these additional characters in a loot box or pay for them as day one DLC, the argument of player choice here would be a somewhat valid design choice. I wouldn't bother to use the three people riding on a horse example like the game's developer did as it would actually be a straw man defense and would show a misunderstanding of the arguments being presented. But I could argue that these games have never really been about the narrative and are more about the game's mechanics and graphics, and in the case of these games, they have taken liberties with historical narratives in the past. I could also argue against the developer's defense, citing partial revisionism with history as British regulations at that time forbade women from taking part in frontline combat. I could also argue that with all of the examples provided citing women that did play a role in World War II, the only British examples are of women placed into insurgency roles or motor pool. I could also argue against the three people riding on the horse as being a game mechanic exploit as opposed to historical accuracy when it comes to narrative and characters. I could even argue that true-to-life events deserve to be treated with greater respect than to be injected with a dose of revisionism in order to include for inclusion's sake, not to promote or celebrate the real-life people that fought and died during a horrific point in human history. I could, if I was so inclined, make a reasonably compelling argument for and against both sides of this current debate, but that's not really why I'm here. No, I'm actually here to discuss how games journalism is handling what is slowly devolving into one big mess. And you know, I've always tended to put the ideals of what a journalist should be up on a bit of a pedestal, enshrined with ideals like objectivity and a duty to the truth above and beyond one's own personal beliefs. I myself have deliberately avoided being labeled a journalist like the plague, shying away from it like a vampire shies away from a cross that has been festooned with garlic steeped in holy water. But the reason for that is I've never gone to school for any of this. I'm not an educated or trained journalist. I'm not recognized by any organizations. I hold no valid press credentials. And to my mind, I'm just a mook with a mic who happens to have a sexy voice and an overdeveloped sense of ethics and responsibility. And while that is the case, I do still try to uphold the ideals of objective journalism. I know that I don't always succeed, but I get it right more often than I get it wrong in that regard. And it is that sense of duty is why I'm not arguing my case for either side of this debate. It's not my place to convince you, the viewer, to accept one side or the other. It's up to me to present to you the facts and how I interpret those facts, and that's basically where my responsibility ends. 
I provide the information and then I do my best to provide an analysis of that information from the basis of my own experience. And from there, it's then your responsibility to come to the conclusion that is right for you based on the information provided. Whether you agree, disagree, or decide that you still need to gather more information or that you just don't care. All of those are valid options. It's entirely up to you what you do with that information at that point. Now, that is at the essence of what I deem to be fair analysis given a scenario like this one. But as a critic, I look at the actions of sites like Polygon and Kotaku. Yes, there are more examples out there, but these two just keep messing up. And by doing so, they are providing a disservice against their readers. Now, the reason for this is their articles are couched in their social and political ideologies. Even persuasive facts against their arguments don't sway them as it doesn't help promote the narrative they wish to impose onto their readers. And therein lies the issue. As a journalist, it's not their job to impose their beliefs onto anyone else, and yet we see them do exactly that time and time again. But for example, we have the Polygon article written by Charlie Hall titled, Battlefield 5's female playable characters are here to stay, says developer, with the sub, a vocal minority of fans got called out by DICE general manager Oscar Gabrielson. Now, the body of the Polygon article isn't all that bad, and only carries undertones of the writer's own beliefs, except for the statement that it is a vocal minority that has a problem with the trailer, when in fact, over half the people who gave the video a thumbs up or a thumbs down disliked the trailer for one reason or another, and while we do see the numbers of those people, it is a piece of information that is devoid of all context. It could very well be that the majority of people are unhappy with the depiction of the women in the video game for one reason or another. It could be the fact that the trailer feels very Call of Duty in how it is portrayed to the viewer. It could even be that a large number of people disliked Angus McSamurai from the House of the Rising Pint that you see on your screen now. But the fact is, we just don't know. It could even be for a completely different reason. Maybe a lot of people just had a really bad day that day. But Polygon misrepresents even the data that's there when they state that it is a vocal minority. The majority of people that saw the trailer actually disliked it from what we can see. To simply call detractors a vocal minority in this case is to attempt to deliberately mislead the reader in order to help support the points made within the article, which very much side with the developers and the statements that they have made. Now then we have Kotaku, and to be honest, I don't even know where to begin. This article couldn't be classified as a news piece. Even calling it an opinion piece would be a very generous application of that label. No, this article from Kotaku, written by Luke Plunkett, someone that I'm reasonably certain I've been publicly critical of in the past, is a hit piece designed strictly to push a social narrative and to mock and deride detractors of the reveal trailer and the design decisions shown therein. And when you, as a journalist, refer to anyone disagreeing with this, having a problem with this, and by extension disagreeing with you and your views as an, quote, angry dork, then you yourself show that you, in fact, have no journalistic integrity and you are misrepresenting the facts to your viewers. You take a complete misunderstanding of any and all facts provided and twist them to fit a social narrative written in a way that isn't even designed to persuade, but is designed in such a way as to simply assuage one's own ego. These sort of articles are what pass for games journalism these days. This is what gamers have to deal with. And while I do enjoy the idea of these people driving eyes to channels like mine through their own expressions of egotism and ideology being held above objectivity and integrity, it's not something that you, the viewer, should ever be placed into a position of being forced to accept. A game's journalism should be there to support the gamers that they provide information for. Games journalism should be more about integrity than it is about social ideologues. And yes, games journalism should be for gamers. It should not be there for one's own social agenda. That does nothing whatsoever to inform gamers, and that means that so-called journalists like Charlie Hall and Luke Plunkett really need to do better for their readers. They need to be better. Because right now, them and those like them provide nothing but swill that contributes nothing at all to the conversation of any worth. But you know, maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm unrealistic when I expect those of us in the public eye to actually stand for our viewers in any way whatsoever. Yes, it is a business. Yes, getting those clicks do matter, especially for publications like Kotaku, IGN, and Polygon. They have a staff of employees that all have to eat, and to be honest, it's actually easier for a single YouTube channel like mine to become profitable than it is a traditional publication and digital print media. But wouldn't it be better to show a little moral fortitude and show that you won't always place your social ideologies above the good of your readers? Wouldn't it create, a, I don't know, maybe a little brand loyalty if your readers knew that they were more valued than a political narrative? Wouldn't it be better 
if you place those that support your publications by providing you with their clicks and their shares to know that providing them with information was a higher priority than sucking up to the developers of the games you cover. I certainly would like to think so, but then again, what do I know? I'm just a mook with a mic, and from the standpoint of these publications, I probably don't even know what I'm talking about. But once again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha, and I'll see you next time.